guest today has spent his life in public relations for a number of institutions, including the YMCA, Fleischman Hillard, and with Nike, where he organized events for a number of Nike Town locations in the 90s. Later in his career, he put together a proposal to create the Department of Nike Archives, or DNA, and he was tasked with accumulating facts and stories pertinent to the origin of the company, and even helped gather materials for Phil Knight's memoir, Shoe Dog. I had a fantastic time discussing Nike history with this guy, my friend, Scott Reams. Okay, so I, I wanted to start with, uh, based on your bio, you're the third generation of shoe salesman? Can I say salesman? Uh, well, we all had different jobs. My grandfather was actually, you know, my grandfather had a shoe, st a shoe store in Eastern St. Or pardon me, what's not really called Eastern St. Louis. Let me start. My grandfather had a shoe store in East St. Louis uh, in the 30s, and then he moved into Brown Shoe Company, which was at that time, I think the largest shoe company, maybe international shoes. They were both based in St. Louis. It was very much the shoe mecca of the mid last century. And then my father, so the, my grandfather's my mother's dad. And then my father started working at Brown Shoe Company as, as a salesman. He would travel. We, we moved from St. Louis to Rochester to Richmond, Virginia, and then back to St. Louis. We did a lot of traveling when we were young. Um, and then he moved to Eugene. He moved us to Eugene when I was in high school because he helped start another footwear company called Osaga, which only the most hardcore older runners would remember Osaga. It had about a five or six year window in the late 70s. And then it, unlike Nike, it turfed and Nike took off. Did Nike have anything to do with them? No, no, no. They, no, they, were, they, they didn't purchase them or anything like that. No, no, Osaga, I think, was purchased by Mitsubishi. You know, it just became a, a city, a subsidiary, and then it slowly just devolved in the '80s and disappeared. Mitsubishi, the car company. Mm -hmm. Well, they own a lot of different things. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I fell in love with Oregon, though. So I wanted to, when, when my parents moved back to St. Louis, I stayed and, and went to University of Oregon and, and just fell in love with an Oregonian, my wife. Um, and then I got a job at Nike. So. It sort of cemented me as the third generation of footwear. But I was never in sales at Nike, so I, that's why I'm not, can't say three generations okay. of salesman. Okay. But three generations of being involved with the shoe industry. Yes. What what kind of shoes did they have in the 30s? Oh, they were all just the patent leather and the, you know, the brown, literally brown shoes. You know, the ones that people wore, detectives and salespeople and housewives. I mean, they they just wore basic shoes. There were, there were no, no running shoes. I mean, that was really the 60s and the 50s and 60s when Adidas and a couple other brands started to really take off. I mean, there was Converse and a couple longer, older brands, but... Uh, but yeah, didn't. that's all people had were dress shoes, right? You'd wear those to mow your lawn or to go to church. Pretty much. I mean, you would have... You could get like sneakers like Keds, you know, I mean, like the basic, basic, like a canvas sneaker, but not really built for specific sports. They were just more to, yeah, to kick around, mow lawns, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. I, I love looking at old photos from like 20s and 30s. Everybody's always wearing a suit and a hat. Yes. It's like you you only had one outfit and you just wore it all the time. Right. Or you watch some of those old movies and old TV shows and dad is always in his, you know, in a suit like, well, it's like 930 at night. You know, he comes into your room to say goodnight and he's still got his suit and tie. I'm yeah. like, dad, take off your tie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like suit and pajamas probably. <laughs> right. And that was kind of it. Yeah. Huh. So did they have to travel around to sell the shoes? Is that why you did so much? Or are you just saying you moved to different locations? Right, different territories. Okay. So dad would be, when we were in Rochester, you know, his territory was all over that part of the state of New York and, and maybe surrounding states. I, I don't know, I was only like two at that time, so. But you're saying he had to travel within the area to sell door to door? It wasn't like they just had a shop? No, the, yeah, they would, they would go door to door, just, uh, mom and pop shop, you know, depending on the size of the, of the account, they would just, uh -huh. because, you know, nowadays it's internet and people go online and they choose what they want and submit the order and Nike ships them out. You know, this was, this was literally going, taking a newest line of, of brown shoes, brown shoe company shoes to store X and meeting with the owner and saying, this is our new line for the fall of 67. And the guy would, or the, well, mostly it was probably guys would say, oh, I'll take this, this shoe and this color and, and the normal, you know, four size six is six and a half, seven, seven, that kind of stuff. And then dad would write up the order and set it in and they would ship him the shoes. Hmm. Yeah. It's a different, different <laughs> method. Yes. Well, I, I mean, people back then, you didn't really get new shoes very often. You, you fixed your current shoes, yes. right? There was, and that was a whole cottage industry of people that would resole and, and, and repair shoes. But that was a little easier because they weren't made out of phylon and, and all sorts of yeah. substances like we have now. Yeah. I mean, they were built to last. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember my dad telling me stories. I mean, his, his family was really poor, so they couldn't afford much anyway. But when he was growing up in the uh, 
the 50s and 60s, he's like, we would get one pair of shoes. And like my older brother, he t- him talking, my older brother would give them to me and then I would wear them for another year or two. Right, right. You just, you there's had nothing, to make it work. There's nothing wrong with them. Just, yeah. you know, strap them on. So what if you're a different shoe size? Sho- you know, shove your foot in there. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll fit into them eventually. <laughs> Give it some time. Hmm. So your your grandpa did that. And then uh, your, your father went into it as well. And uh, did you, did that play any part in you deciding to go to Nike? Or was that just an afterthought? It was, I don't think it was related because uh, by the time... I was into, I mean, I got into Nike when I was 31, right? So I'd already had a couple of other jobs and uh, it just, Nike just seemed to be a brand that really I connected with, you know, just the the, the self-deprecation, the irreverence. The, I just, I just felt like, wow, that's, that's me. That's a, I could, I could, I could really play there and literally. And, and then I could be, I can contribute, I thought. And so it turned out I did <laughs> and, and I, and I did enjoy it, but it wasn't, it wasn't so much because I was familiar with the footwear industry, because I really wasn't. I mean, my dad did a lot of that on uh, business, but he was traveling a lot. And it wasn't like I'd, we'd, we'd come home, we'd talk, have deep talks about the, the footwear business. You know? <laughs> but the, the irony was, it was, this was really an eye-opening thing. When I first started doing the historian role, uh, I would meet some people and, and uh, who worked at Nike or were still working at Nike. And they'd say, what's your last name again? And I'd say, Reams. Is your dad Bob Reams? Yeah. I know your dad. And I said, you do? And he said, they would say the things like, yeah, in 1976, the Olympic trials, you, you, your parents had a big party up at their house. And I said, yeah, I bartended that party. <laughs> I was there. And they're like, yeah, I was there. And, then, and so people are like, I saw your house. I think I met you. And I was, I'm, I'm like, this is like Jeff Hollister. You know, it's like employee number three tells me this. And uh-huh. I, um, then I find out later, you know, my, my high school guidance counselor is named John Gillespie. John Gillespie was the man who created the Stop Pre T-shirt that's so popular and iconic. And, you know, I was like, what? You know, the, you're doing this? You had done this when I was in your room in, in 1976 or 77 talking about my college uh, uh, you know, aspirations. You had already designed Stop Pre. <laughs> it was just so well, like, weird. So you said you were living in Eugene in what year? We moved there in 1976, right before my 10th grade in high school. Okay. So, I mean, you were at the center of all of that stuff that was happening. I was, but not really realizing it. Because yeah. with St. Louis, you're, it's baseball, 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 and, and some hockey, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that was... And so, I am, I'm not kidding. When I, the first couple of days I, I got to South Eugene High School, uh, somebody was talking about Steve Prefontaine, and he had died about a year before then. And I said out loud to enough of people that they heard me, I said, who's Steve Prefontaine? Oh, no. And the room just looked, I mean, everybody was like, what? You know? <laughs> and I didn't know. I didn't follow track and field. I knew, you know, I knew some of the, like Olympian Olympians, like some of the big ones, because uh, you know, they're so pop, they're so famous, but I didn't know. I'd not heard of Steve's name before. And, you know, I get teased about that all the time now. It's like, well, you know Steve's name now? I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, I know Steve now. But that was one of those moments of like, you're not in Missouri anymore. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, this is a different crowd. Cause, well, I mean, he was obviously a very important individual, and because of him, uh, a bunch of things were made possible. I always wonder when something like that happens, if if the death, the untimely death of someone makes them more mythical. You know, I, I've talked a lot about, I know a, a lot about music. I follow a lot in music, and there's this thing called the 27 Club. You ever heard of that? I have, yes. Yeah. It it sounds messed up to say, but it almost benefits people sometimes if they go before they're done. When somebody walks away, when they're at the top, Mm -hmm. all you can think about is what could have been. Right. And so not to take anything away from him, but he was at the top and then this horrible thing happened to him. And then, yeah, he just become this mythic figure that you didn't know who he was. (laughs) No, but you're right. I mean, from music, Hendrix and Joplin and, and, uh, or to uh, James Dean, Marilyn Monroe. I mean, these people, you you can literally, literally paint any future and it could be possible. I mean, Steve Prefontaine, if he had not had that accident would be, uh, I would say 72, I think early Mm seventies. Um, maybe he had a career in track and field. Maybe he was a head coach. Maybe he went into a, became a car salesman. I mean, who knows? Yeah. He could have literally done anything and we'll, and we'll never know because he died at 24. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I think people, uh, I mean, myself included, can get kind of stuck on like what would have happened, you know, because you, you'll never know. And yeah. it's it's uh, it's really weird when somebody takes off too early. Um, yeah. 
Uh, so you're you're in Eugene in '76, you said. Yes. And you decided to go into what 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 were you studying? At the University of Oregon, I was first studying math and going to become a math teacher. And it turned out I am really good at math in my head. I'm not very good at math at teaching other people how to okay. do it. So I would just look at things and say, well, it's clearly it's 17 times pi or whatever, you know. And they're like, well, how do you know that? And I'm like, well, uh, you, you just, it's right there. I mean, how could you not see that, you know? And, and you need to be a little more uh, instructive when you're being an instructor. So I was not very happy. It was very uh, stressful. Uh, the student teaching that I did, the, the, the students were kind of, difficult to work with. The teachers were upset with their their principal. It was just, I walked into basically politics and not really that altruistic, I'm going to hear to mold young minds type thing. And it just, I decided I needed to take a step back. So that's when I, I uh, stepped away from the University of Oregon and was working, I was working at the YMCA in Eugene as, at their front desk and, and writing some newsletters for the, because, for, you know, the nonprofit, you're pressed into service to do all sorts of things. And over time, I started writing the newsletters for the child care center and the tennis center. And then finally, the director of the YMCA said, I, I can't I appreciate you're doing this on your own time, but we need to pay you for this. So he created a, a PR role and I started doing that. And then he made it full time over time. So I did that for oh, about four years into the late 80s and then realized, oh, my gosh, I love public relations. I love journalism. I love writing. And so then I went back to school to the University of Oregon and did my second tour of duty. But this time as a journalism major, and I graduated in about a little over a year. Cool. So that experience helped you decide that that was what you were into. Yes. You didn't care about math anymore. No. <laughs> it's, it's great when I'm balancing my checkbook. But yeah, beyond that, yeah. it's like the, I don't get excited about the quadratic equation. Yeah. Well, math is unique because it's always right or wrong. There's no art in math. You know, that is so funny to say that. That's what I liked about it. Every time you multiply four times seven, you get 28, whether you're underwater on Mount Everest or on Mars, it's the same number. And for a long time, my mind appreciated and liked that. And then something happened, and all of a sudden I was like, no, when you're a writer and a journalist, 20 people can see exactly the same thing happen, and they can all write about something different. And that's really amazing, mm -hmm. you know? And it was, it was like this complete 180. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. You went from one to the other because it's two different mindsets. It is. It's almost like my, my, the polarity in my brain switched or something. And I went from like a left brain to a right brain. I don't know. It was weird. It was weird. Cause some people, even to this day, years and years later are surprised that I'm not in math and I'm not really a logical, like Spock type of person anymore. Nothing significant happened. It just was like a gradual shift. I think so. Yeah. I think it was the freedom to, to be able to write. And, you know, as I said, I was, I was just a, the monthly paycheck was when we had the newsletter at the Y and the, the the newsletter was written by the the director's assistant who was a lovely person but not a gifted writer yeah so it'd be like you know, on thursday we're all gonna get together for carolyn's birthday and have cookies don't be late you know and you know it's like <laughs> so and she hated doing it and so I, finally i said to her i said kim why don't do you want me to take a shot at that this month or maybe she was on vacation and i volunteered i don't remember why but people, I, I did, but I put some flair in it. I wrote a little bit more about the, the mundane, but I made it a little more interesting, yeah. apparently. And uh, I got people coming up saying, this is great. Did you write this? You know, and then Kim came back and she goes, oh my God, this is so much better than I do. Can you, would you mind doing this on a regular basis? And nice. so that's what started it. And then, like I said, the other the other parts of the facility all said, would you write our newsletter? We, I hate doing this too. So I think it just, it came up organically that way, which was kind of cool. And I looked forward to it. I looked forward mm -hmm. to the writing. I looked forward, it, even throughout the month, I would think about what else can I put in here, you know? And so it became more of a story gathering and storytelling, which is exactly what I did later in, at Nike. Well, yeah, that's, in my opinion, one of the, the biggest reasons that Nike's been successful is they're great at telling stories. Absolutely. And that's what everyone wants. I mean, that's what we've been doing for thousands of years. It's, it's the old version of the movie. It's the old version of music. Like it's entertainment. And if you can captivate people and, and pull at their heart, then you can sell sneakers. <laughs> exactly. You can sell a brand. Basically yeah. that's, that's what Nike has done so long and so well is they've sold the brand. People mm -hmm. affiliate with the brand, not more so than that pair of shoes or that, that running outfit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, God, where was I going? Um, so you you were there at the YMCA and you saw an opening for something and you gave it a shot and you enjoyed it and mm -hmm. other people enjoyed it. 
And I, I feel like based on what I know about you so far, you uh, seem to take advantage of those situations where there's nothing mm -hmm. and then you kind of create something and you step in and fill that role. And I think that's really cool. I, I think I, I try to do that too. And I appreciate people who do that because regular life and your regular job can get so boring. Yes. And so many people are so unfulfilled in whatever they're doing. And if you just see something, you want to like draw pictures and put them on the fridge right. at work, like whatever, that's awesome. If there's something you can do that's going to fulfill you, I feel like you kind of owe it to yourself to try to make that happen. Well, I'm doing PR for the why was about the easiest job I ever had because I believed fervently in the why and what it did, its mission, the people it helped, what it helped for the community. So I wasn't even doing PR in the traditional sense. I would just be talking to a reporter about the why. And I didn't have my talking points. I didn't have to think, oh yeah, I have to make sure I remember to say X or Y. It was just, it was just an extension of who I am or was. So it was a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. And again, that sort of became the same mantra at, at Nike. I believed in the brand. I believed, I didn't agree with everything Nike did, but I believed in general that it was doing the right thing. And so it was easy for me to do public relations for it because I wasn't, I wasn't forcing myself to try to get that message in, you know, deliver that sound bite. Yeah. People can pick up on that stuff. I mean, I think that's why we look negatively upon lobbyists and certain types of lawyers, you know, they're not really feeling it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like if you got paid to talk about your kids, that would be awesome. Right. Like, exactly. tell me how much you love your kids and you're going to pay me for that. <laughs> Sweet. Let's do it. Exactly. You know, that's pretty cool. Okay, so you were then at the YMCA and uh, working on PR, and then you transitioned into something else? Yes. So after I graduated from college, I, I'd gotten married by this point, so um, I didn't have the luxury of just kind of goofing around. Plus, I was 28, so it was time to, time to get my act together. Uh, so we ended up, my wife and I actually ended up moving back to St. Louis, of all places. My wife actually got a job offer there, and I followed her, and then I got a, a job at a company or an agency called Fleshman Hillard which was up and coming at the time. Now I think it's the largest agency in the world, but at the time it was, it was kind of the, the up and comer. And they also had, they had uh, cli uh, clients like Anheuser-Busch, you know, some really cool clients to work with. I got Valvoline. So I did a little more uh, instant oil change grand openings in Lexington, Kentucky. Those nice. were super fun. And my friends are like, oh, we're going to Moscow with the Rolling Stones with the Budweiser group. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> But again, this is I, I, when I talk to high school students or when I, I do class, or I talk to class about this. This is one of those things where something falls into into place there that you don't appreciate or realize until later. And so, while working on the Valvoline account wasn't exactly glamorous, it and I was actually even even got less glamorous. I thought when I was assigned to the to do PR for the top field drag racer Joe Amato, uh, I knew nothing about you know those those long skinny uh, things that go 300 miles per hour and they, like, and they stop after 10 seconds and and i was like R really working all day long for a 10 second race you know yeah um but i you know you don't have any choice when you work for an agency you're kind of assigned and you do it so i did the pr for joe that whole year and got to know a lot of people in the racing industry and that came in uh, handy for me because then when my wife and I both realized that this wasn't what we wanted to do, I didn't want to be a PR for drag racing and she didn't, she had a job in St. Louis she didn't particularly, particularly care for. Um, we said we wanted to start, start looking for something back in the Northwest. So I had an offer or an, basically a chance to meet a person who ran the, the Budweiser GI Joe's 200 IndyCar race, which is here in Portland. Uh, this is back in 92, 91, excuse me. Um, and he was looking for a PR director and he knew me through some, you know, some connections. And, and, and so he had, I flew out and I interviewed and I got the job. So if I don't get the Valvoline account, I don't get the interview with the, the, the event company in Portland and on the event company in Portland while I was there, guess what I did? I started working with and meeting people from Nike, mm -hmm. right? So all of these, tr all these tracks are kind of laying down in front of me and that's what led to my essentially having that opportunity to find out about a job at Nike in 92. And that's where I was for the next almost 30 years. Well, yeah, I feel like the struggle is really important. And I've had a lot of horrible jobs and all they made me want to do was get a better job. Mm -hmm. you but you want to learn from it, right? I mean, you want, you want yeah. to pull something from it. So you're not yeah. like, oh my God, I just wasted two years of my life. Well, yeah, I think you do whether or not you're trying to. 
you just, you realize you're, if you're paying attention and you're interacting with people, you're always going to get better because you meet new individuals and you understand why somebody's upset about something. Mm -hmm. And you, you're able to, to evaluate people and read them a little bit better. And I think that's the most important skill in the universe is understanding people, mm -hmm. giving them a break, forgiving them, letting, what I always try to tell my kids is, is if someone's mad at you, somebody's flipping you off and screaming at you on the freeway, or what, they're not mad at you. They have stuff in their life yeah. that they are taking out on you. Right. That's human nature. And it's not okay most of the time, but if you can understand that and forgive people and just kind of work with it, it's so important. Cause that's, I mean, I feel like that's the thing I've gotten the best at over the last 25 years of interacting with CEOs and executives and people who work at gas stations and, you know, dealing with somebody at Starbucks, like everybody's mm -hmm at a different spot in their life. They've got different amounts of money. They've got different stressors. They're going through a divorce. There's so many factors that go into what that other person is doing. And if you can just kind of roll with it and be like, you know, I had some tough times. I would have done the same thing. I think that's that's like one of the most important things you can do. And it sounds like you working for the uh, for Valvoline, you know, doing the the drag races, I mean, I bet you met some amazing people and maybe it wasn't fulfilling all the time, but it took you to the next step. Oh, there was definitely a few times where I was like, I'm looking around thinking, how did I get here? And not, not, not in a negative way, but more of a wonder way. Like I'm sitting here in Pomona, California at the NHRA championship because Joe actually won the year that I was there. So, I mean, it was in terms of having to do PR, it was great because everybody wanted to talk to Joe. So at least I wasn't representing you know, the 37th ranked you know, guy that nobody would heard of. And they'd be like, thank you, we're, we're good. So people wanted to talk to Joe. So that was another plus. And, and I, again, the, the racing industry is very um, familial. They're very helpful. A lot of those folks knew that like, they could tell if one looked at me, I'm, I'm not, this is not where I was meant to, I'm not necessarily meant to be, but this is not exactly the dream job I, w I was looking for. So yeah. they'd be very helpful and very, and Joe especially and his and his wife and, and the, the crew would help explain, you know, they'd use acronyms or something like that. And I'd go, huh? And they'd go, oh, that means this. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it was, it was fun. I mean, we, it was, it was a good, it was a good year, but I was ready to move on to something else. And, but yes, I, if, if I hadn't had that year, would have, my life would have gone in a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. You you can't really anticipate why you choose to do some things, but it opens you up for for something better sometimes. Yeah. So you guys came back to Eugene or did you came back to Portland? Portland, Portland. Okay, you came back to Portland and you got a job doing events for who? It's called Global Events Group. I think it still exists. I don't, because the IndyCar series has had a number of different changes. I don't know if it's, I don't, I think it finally came back to Portland and under a different name, but it, it had its heyday back when I was with the company in the, in the 90s and then it, it disappeared for a while. And I don't know what, if they're still doing events or not. It's, it was a pretty small operation. And how do you feel about events? Like the act of planning and organizing and, and throwing parties and that? Oh, I love them. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're looking at the guy who's organized his high school reunion every year <laughs> since 1989. Um, you guys do it every year? No, no, every 10 years, excuse okay. me, every, okay. every five or 10 years. So okay. yeah, but every time there's a reunion, I'm the one doing it. I'm actually uh, heading to Boston in August because I've gotten together the class or the, the dorm floor that I was with in 1982-83 at UMass when I went on exchange for a year. I went to the University of Massachusetts Amherst and just fell in love with these people. They were so great. So we're actually getting together in August for the first time since 1983. I organized that. <laughs> so nice. Uh, yeah, we I, I love events. I love putting them on. My wife and I love to give parties, so it's it's just a it's just something we get a lot of satisfaction out of. And then because what Nike was looking for in 1992 was they're looking for a marketing events and public relations coordinator for the two, for the new Nike Town stores. Well, that's you know, again people know marketing and public relations. Those are actually two very different disciplines. One's in the business school at the university, the other's in the journalism school. So people use them a lot interchangeable and, and interchangeably, and they're really not. We're sort of adjacent, but not the same. And then to have an event coordinator too. So I, I, when I applied for the job, I was I got it, and obviously, or I wouldn't be here. Uh, and I was told months later that out of like 250 or 300 applicants, I was the only person who had demonstrable experience in marketing events and public relations. So for the, I guess that made it easy for them to hire me. I hmm. don't know. 
You think they should have just hired three people instead? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <As> <laughs> you it, probably had a lot of work to do. As it turned out, yes. In fact, when I did move on out of that position a year and or two years later, they hired two people to replace me. As, nice. as I had been saying forever, I am doing two people's jobs. Uh-huh. So I want more money. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it works, Scott. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I've, I've been in events for 20 years. And so I, I understand the struggles and the rewards. It is, it's very weird going to the things that people go to once or twice a year. And I go to them every day mm -hmm. and I go to a new site every single day and my schedule is never the same. And I think that would drive most people crazy, but I actually kind of like it. I don't know that I could do a nine to five office job. I mm. like that it's different all the time. So yeah. That part's cool. I agree. And that's, it, that was one of the, definitely the positives. I mean, you never knew, I, I didn't know from day to day, even what athlete I might have come to my store. Right. And sometimes I would find out the last minute that, uh, well, for example, John McEnroe was in Portland visiting with Phil Knight. And next thing I know, I get a call saying, do you want John to come down to the store? And I said, when? He said, tomorrow. I'm like, tomorrow? <laughs> yes. You know, so. Well, they think you're going to say, no, don't bring him down. So I, you know, immediately I'm like getting a press release out. I'm like, and, oh, and he can't do this, but he, he won't be here till then. And, and I was like, okay, um, all right. And, you know, and then it was like, it was like then almost like reverse Jenga. Like, what do you, how do you put this together? You know, what can it be? Um, we could, we put on the event and it was great. And we had a great turnout. And I actually got some criticism or at least some feedback that we had it too early in the day because kids would, were skipping school. Oh, so wow. I had, so I had to, I had to move all from that point forward. Most of the athlete appearances we did when I had the freedom to, with time, sometimes they literally only had a, a specific window. Uh, I would try to do it like at two thirty or three, cause I had to have enough time for the local media to be able to get down, get their footage and then get it on the five o'clock news. Yeah. But I couldn't have it too early and the kids were skipping out of school. So it was like this tightrope walk of making sure that we had both. Yeah. Cause you, you gotta, you gotta take care of the adult factor and you gotta take care of the kid factor too. Well, especially if, if they're going to show up and if kids come into Nike town, that's great. I mean, that we were, the Nike town really wasn't built to be a, a playground for kids per se, but if they fall in love with it and, and, and that becomes their place that they go to knowing that they're going to see Nolan Ryan or, I mean, we had, I had, I had like a cavalcade of stars in there for the first couple of years because Nike sports marketing had been asked to also help pu you know, publicize the stores and get athletes to come in. And since the first two stores, one was at, the first was in Portland with Nike right here, that was easy. And then the second one was in Chicago, which, you know, we had some the local basketball team was doing pretty well in the 90s. So we could get Scottie Pippen or Kerr. I never could get Michael. That was next level but yeah but you know and short with the bulls in the 90s any any bull showed up and the place was packed yeah what about clyde what about terry porter clyde, I, uh, they, clyde they might not be Nike clyde guys. was a via guy so we okay. never had clyde Ter terry um jerome almost all the rest of the blazers of the of the 90s were nike except for clyde and i think uh i don't remember if uncle cliffy was i can't remember yeah yeah it's it's interesting that the the team is here uh, but then they, they couldn't get Clyde. It's the same thing with Dame. Dame's Adidas, isn't he? Dame's is Adidas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't, you can't sign them all. Every once in a while, can't you're like, sign oops, them whoops, that would have been a good one. Mm -hmm. All right, so are we talking about the Nike town that is downtown Portland near Pioneer Square? The original one was at 6th and Salmon. It's now been, it's closed and it's now down the street at, uh, it's called the Nike, I think it's called Nike Portland. It's, uh, it's down near Pioneer Square, yes. Okay. It moved about four blocks away, I think. So you had to go into the office every day or it was just when there were events? I was mostly on the campus in, in Beaverton. Okay. Um, I only went into the store because I, did, I didn't have an office in the store. The store was, is, what no, was very small. And so there was almost no place for me to even set up shop. I would usually basically just hang out in the corner of the, the manager's office and do my thing and then <laughs> pack up. Uh, but we, we, we had signed the, uh, the fifth quarter. So we did the blaze we did after the, after half of the blazers home games, we would do a live, uh, event from the store. So like at nine 30 or so at night, uh, we would have John Stockton come in or something and sit on and sit on a little dais in the middle of the store. Wow. That was pretty fun. That was, but uh, except for the nights, like in the middle of February, you know, and it's pouring down rain and, and we couldn't get an A-list athlete. And so the store, there'd be like six people and the store manager would just stare at me the whole time. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah. That's like being in a band and you go play the bar and like only your friends show up. Yes. <laughs> uh, what was security like? Did you guys have to have the real 
bouncers and stuff? We had two Nike security folks, but they weren't, They, I mean, they were not imposing. And, and we were, I don't know, maybe it was a different, well, certainly a different time than downtown Portland now. But we, I don't remember ever having anything that was like, uh-oh, we better, and the, and the security guys were pretty prevalent. One was always up front and, you know, we just wanted to make sure that people behaved. And and uh, I decided from the get-go that these were not going to be autograph opportunities. I didn't, that's not why the athlete should be there. It's not really, uh, there's other opportunities if they wish to do that. And I, I didn't want them to just, pe- people just like rushing down, like, you know, jamming stuff in, in the athlete's face the whole time. And they were supposed to be there to deliver a message or to talk to Scott Lynn, the host of the show. So what I did was I started uh, having the athletes sign like half a dozen hats or basketball, whatever whatever we had, uh, and then I would hand, we'd hand out raffle tickets and we'd say, okay, um, John Stockton is here today, but he's not going to sign autographs. However, he has already signed a dozen caps, and so keep your raffle number. And after he's finished, we'll do the numbers. And 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 so that that worked on two different levels. People did get a chance to, and so they were happy about that. They didn't try to harass the athlete. But also, while we were calling the numbers, that gave us a chance to spirit Scott or spirit the athlete out, um, and then there wouldn't be people waiting for him trying to grab him on the way out the door. Yeah. So that helped with security as well because that did keep people at bay and, and not trying to, to constantly interrupt. And that worked for every one of our events. We did it for Nolan Ryan. We did it for um, pretty much every athlete that was in the store. We do the same raffle, and then the athlete could disappear, and it's like whew. sneak out the back. Yep. Yeah. When I was younger, we used to always wait outside the venue to try to meet the band and try to, you know, shake their hand or say hi or whatever. And we'd always wait for so long and they'd sneak out some other door and be like, man, we were waiting here forever. <laughs> Sometimes we'd get to see them, but not, not quite as often as I liked. Uh, but yeah, I remember being a kid and I, I'm not that into sports anymore. I can appreciate a, a talented athlete, but I just don't follow anything anymore. But when I was a kid, I was way into baseball and mm-hmm. basketball. And what I used to do was I'd take my favorite card, basketball or baseball card, and I'd put it in an envelope. Then I'd take another envelope, okay. put a stamp on it, mm. and write my return address. And I'd stick it in there, and I'd send it to Michael, or I'd send it to Clyde, or I'd send it to Ken Griffey Jr., whoever. And you would be amazed at how many people signed the card. I mean, maybe they had somebody signing them for it, but it was, yeah. it was the card I sent them right. with real pen on it and i must have got back 10 or 15 signed cards wow, that's cool it was really cool uh there were a few times where they kept my card and they sent a different one which i was always kind of bummed about <laughs> like uh, that's my rookie card it's gonna be worth a lot well, of money yeah well yeah like uh barry bond sent back some shitty franz bread card <laughs> you know how they used to give you cards and yeah, loaves of bread i do yeah and i sent like a five dollar card that would have been worth way more money uh, but it, it was pretty cool. I was, um, I didn't appreciate how important that was when I was a kid. I just was chucking them out the, the, the door, trying to get them back and yeah, it would work. It's pretty ingenious. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can understand how those events would be pretty big. Did you have, did you have just lines of kids out the street, out, out on the block? It would depend on the marquee level of the athlete and and the time. Like fifth quarter is not so much because, again, that was usually after a, a game. So it would be like 9.30 or 10 in downtown Portland. So it would be pretty rare that we'd have it, – mostly it would be people coming from, I would assume, from the well, – I guess it was the Rose Garden back then or – was it, was it even the Rose Garden back then? I, well, anyway. Yeah, I well, don't know. What was it before the Rose Garden? The, the memorial – uh, Coliseum. Oh, before they built the Rose Garden. I'm trying to remember when the, anyway, it doesn't matter, but they would come from the game and yeah. they would hear us, the, they, Scott Lane would be like, well, we're coming, we're going to be coming to you live from Nike town after the game. And our guest tonight will be and whoever it was. And so we did have a number of families or, or people who come in for that reason, but it was pretty, it was the daytime events that we did. Uh, Nolan Ryan especially comes to mind. Nolan Ryan was a packed house. Yeah. And that was a challenge because no one, uh, was very notorious and I was even told that he wouldn't do media, wouldn't do interviews. So I'm like, well, shoot. <laughs> I mean, the whole idea of getting the media there is to have availability to meet Nolan. So I thought about it and thought about it. And finally I decided I came up with a, a, what I thought was a workaround. So I pitched it to the, to the sports marketing director for baseball and he said, that might work. And the idea was that I would invite the sports reporters from all the PIL schools. So Grant, you know, I'd get, I'd, I'd invite them to, and, and they would get a chance to basically do a press conference to interview Nolan. And then the local media could circle around the outside, the periphery of the, the room 
and record the students in it doing the interview. And apparently, no, well, obviously not apparently because no one did it, but no one loved the idea. Hmm. So the the place was jammed. I mean, it was I'm sure the fire marshal was well, it's probably the statute of limitations has run out on that, but it, <laughs> it was packed with because not only because the high school kids are there, but they've told their friends, so they're all coming down. And two questions in, I think the third question, no one looks down at the kid and he looks up at the rest of the people and all the media around the outside and he points at them and goes, How come y'all don't ask me good questions like this? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the place just cracked up. Yeah, you know, so this little, this like 18 year old, it's like, you know, literally Nolan Ryan just said, you just asked me an amazing question. So he's probably on cloud nine. You know, the media are lapping up because they're getting this great footage of, of students getting a dream interview. And they still got to sort of interview Nolan and hear his answers to some questions. So that was probably when I look back on the one where I would go, I kicked ass on that one. Yeah. That, that was a good event. But that was, that was by far the most full the building ever was for an event. Huh. Yeah, I could see that. He, he seems like a pretty no nonsense type of dude. Is it, I mean, he played for the Rangers. I imagine he lived in Texas for a long time. He, he just seems like he's on a ranch, hanging out, taking care of the, the cattle. You know, like he seems like a yeah. like a country boy. Well, I mean, seven no hitters. I mean, he, are you crazy? Yeah, he's very impressive. I don't know how you could be that consistent. He played for like 27 years, 30 years. I don't know if it was close to that. And it he was played, a long time. And he played for four different teams, which is amazing too. Yeah. Uh, so you'd think that you'd be on, if you're Nolan Ryan, you like have your, you write your ticket and stay with one team for your whole career. But he, he, he played with four teams. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. All right. So you're doing, you're doing all the PR at Nike Town and you, you did all the stuff in Portland, and you said uh, Chicago too. Did you have to go to Chicago? Oh, I, I, I knew the flight attendants on, the, on United pretty much by name because I was flying there once every two weeks or so. Just basically, it, what, sometimes we would do an event, and it was going to be a series, so we do it in Portland and then do it in Chicago or vice versa. Like if we're going to do a new um, a new product line launch, you know, so we would we'd have models and we'd have the new product, and and so we'd all do it in Portland, and then a week later the same group would show up in Chicago and we do the same thing. Sometimes we did those, and others it was purely based on the, the the market itself. So something was going on in Chicago, Chicago Marathon. You know, we, we do a, an event there. Um, and then we opened up Orange County and Atlanta. And I was like, I can't be in four places at one time. So they finally did start to hire uh, people that were based in each of the stores. So I didn't have to be the overarching person. I was, I was then back to just doing Portland. We had a Chicago person, Atlanta, Orange County. And that was good. But then it also I started to get a little bit of the been there, done that with that. So yeah. I was uh, I was starting to look around by the end of 94, early 95. And that was the next chapter. That was to your point earlier about creating something. I, I realized after working with all these sports marketing people for so long that, and this is, you know, before the internet had really, uh, I think the internet was sort of in its nascence. Um, there was no access to get current stats you had to literally go online or i mean not you had to literally get on the phone and call the houston astros and say can you please fax me nolan ryan's current statistics because they're just you didn't couldn't go to mlb.com yeah um and i just and i you know the more that and then you know some athletes have food allergies some athletes have food preferences some athletes have you know what they want a size seven they want a size nine they have their daughter and i just said you know we don't really we have we have thousands of athletes in a variety of different sports, but we don't have a database, a central point keeping track of all of these things. We should, we should have like sports information director basically like a university does or, or a professional team. And so I pitched the idea to the sports marketing director at the time and he liked it. And next thing I know, I wasn't called sports information director, but I was doing something similar to that. And then that evolved into, the other thing I had said was it, it's really difficult to get an athlete in Chicago when I have to, when I, when I don't have a specific need, right? It's not like I need a White Sox player. I just need a Chicago based athlete. So what I would have to do is I'd have to just pick a sport. I go to the, the, the baseball sports marketing people and say, can I get a Chicago Cub or a Chicago White Sox on July 7th at Nike town? And I'd wait and I'd wait and I'd wait. And then they'd come back and they'd say, we don't, the Cubs are out of town and the White Sox probably can't do it. And I'd start all over again with the, the footwork guy, football mm -hmm. guy, and I'd talk about a Chicago Bear. Wait, 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 no. Then I have to go to the basketball. You know, I thought this is silly. I need, I should just go. It should be centralized. I should be able to go to somebody and say I need a Chicago athlete, and then that person works with all the sports marketing people, and they find this one person, or in, or even somebody who lives in in Chicago or is from Chicago. It doesn't have to be a Chicago athlete. And that whole idea 
hit a, a nerve, I guess, with the person I pitched it to. And he said, yeah, so next thing I know, we're, we're doing, I'm the head of a, a department of three people or four people eventually. And we did exactly that. We were we did athlete appearances. We brokered them. We arranged them. We did the travel. Uh, and then we would make sure we'd get an athlete to a sales meeting. We'd get an athlete to, uh, and this was, so this was beyond Nike town. This was like for ad, ad shoots and um, sales meetings and, and wherever that an athlete was needed for Nike purposes, we would we would then negotiate with the agent, uh, try to use their appearances that are in their contract but as much as possible, uh, and then schedule them to be in Phoenix for Slam Fest or be in you know Dallas for the opening of a of a Dick Sporting Goods store or something like that. That's crazy. So you're you're accumulating data on these players and figuring out what city they're in, uh, you know what what place they're staying at, whether or not they can actually go visit if it's in their car. Like that's a lot of stuff to manage. It was, but we were waste. Nike was wasting a lot of money throwing these appearances into a contract and then never using them because no one knew that they were, I mean, they, you knew they were there, but you didn't really think about, Hey, you know, like I keep using Stockton, but you know, Stockton's got four more appearances in his contract this year. And if <laughs> we didn't use them anywhere, then he would, those would just go unused and we'd pay for them and get nothing out of it. But, and we knew that John Stockton lived in Spokane. Right. And so if there was going to be an Eastern Washington event of some kind, even though they don't have any professional teams, we, we could suggest, hey, you got something in such and such, you know, we could we could ask, we could approach John Stockton. So there was that level of switchboard operating a little bit of trying to find. And, and again, knowing the homes, towns or the schools where they went to, um, you know, that was just not it's now it's so prevalent. You can get it online super easy. But we had to we had to literally put a database together. That had all this information that we could look up at our fingertip and just say, okay, what athletes live in St. Louis? What athletes are from Cleveland? Or what athletes went to University of Miami? And so you were logging all this information in a computer system, right? Or was yes. it on paper? Uh, it was from paper into a computer system. Okay. We worked with a, our tech people to create a, a system. Huh. And is that a pretty common thing that when you sign an athlete and create a shoe for them or, or any sort of apparel, you say, hey, you have to come hang out with us five times a year? Not common. And it's usually done as in marketing, I mean, a negotiating uh, contract thing. So we might throw in an extra $10,000 and that, that'll be good for, for two or four uh, appearances. And then there's usually uh, for a very popular athlete, there might be a, a an addendum that says, and then five thousand dollars per additional, because that way you get away from the haggling and and you know having to do like, well, he wants fifteen thousand dollars. Well, the contract says three or yeah. five, or whatever. So it was it, it it was very much streamlining the ability to get an athlete someplace. Huh. I, th I think that's interesting because you could. I mean, what if you sign Jordan and you're like, hey, you got to meet us at McDonald's twice a year. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm not doing no. that. As I said, there were different levels for Jordan and, and some of the other like elite, elite athletes. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Like I told you earlier, I do a lot of work at Nike and I've been going to campus since uh, probably 2016, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was so cool when I came out there and you're driving around and you see the parking spots and it'll say Michael yes. Jordan, John McEnroe, right. Serena Williams. And I'm like... They have a parking spot? How often are they out here? I know. And people. it's not that often, but they know they have a parking spot when they come to campus. Well, actually, that's what that is, is that's assigned to a different Nike executive. Ah, okay. So I, I, when Michael or anybody comes, I don't think they drive themselves. They get no. driven to the campus. But no, that rather than put an, an executive's name on it and then an executive leaves or retires, it's just like if, if you know, I'd never had one because I was never a VP, but let's say I had a spot and it was Mark McGuire then I just knew that I was in the Mark McGuire spot. And nice. so then if, when I leave the company, somebody else is now Mark McGuire, you know? Ah. But yeah, we have a lot of people will see that and they'll go like, that's a parking spot for John McEnroe? <laughs> like, well, yeah. Well, you, yeah. Every time I go out there and there is a car in that spot, I'm always like, oh, they're here. But I guess not. <laughs> no. Well, that, and the other thing I used to always get was the speed limit signs on the campus are like 14.5 yep. and 19.5. And there's all this lore about this is the height of somebody or the best time of somebody else. And I'm like, no, that was just done so people would remember them. And it's so disappointing. Hmm. Sometimes I'm very buzzkill, you know? <laughs> well, you have all the secrets now. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that they have incorporated into campus. And I know because I read Shoe Dog and uh, just like in the new LeBron James building, the the pink bucket yep. upstairs, yep. which was the place that they used to go drink. Yep. Pink bucket tavern on Powell Boulevard. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Okay. I mean, they, they, campus is so impressive. You walk through those buildings and especially like Serena, the, there's some woodwork that yes. they've done just on the regular floors yep. where people are just punching away at computers. 
it is the most beautiful uh, woodwork carving you've ever seen in your life. And it's just in the middle of a building. Right. It's so impressive, man. All the stuff that they just did recently. How about the floor when you walk into the uh, to the LeBron James building? That's and it's cool like too. A, a little mark on for every shot he's ever taken. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, like that, just laying that out would have been, I, I can't even imagine doing that. Yeah. No, when I first saw that and I realized what it was, I was like, somebody got paid yes. to figure out where every single shot was taken from. And I mean, a lot of them, it's just like a huge gold area because sure. LeBron took a hundred shots from that same spot. Right. But then there's like one way back behind the three point line. You're like, whoa, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. crazy. No, they, they, um, they have a lot of money and they've been really yep. good at uh, recruiting talent and selling product, but it also allows them to kind of do stuff that you would never, you would never think you could do. Like what other company in the world is going to pay somebody to figure out every single shot that LeBron took <laughs> and then put it inside the building? No one else is going to do that. Maybe Apple, but I mean, they don't have superstars, right? They have people with pocket protectors, <laughs> right. you know, it's different. So that part is really cool. Um, so going back to, so you're doing all the Nike town stuff and, uh, then you, did we get to it yet? I don't think we got to it yet where you create the position for DNA. That comes in, uh, one more position later. Okay. I, I let's had, let's had, do that one then. Yeah. I had four distinct different roles at the company over, over the 29 and a half year, 29 years I was there. So yeah, so sports marketing was the second. That was from 94, 95 into 97. Um, that evolved, I guess, into a, gr a group called Athlete Relations. Um, same type of thing. We were still doing events and, and, and doing the, uh, arranging the schedules, but we we're also doing a little bit more working with the athletes to do more of their marketing for them personally as a, and within the company. And that really wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, again, I got a little bit of the been there, done that. And at that time in 97, there was a change in the PR direction with the company. And there was a man named Lee Weinstein, who I had known for since literally since we both started. And he was going to take over as the PR director. And he and I had always gotten along great. He knew my background in public relations. And so I approached him and I just said, look, I, I would love to do my first love, which is public relations. Um, and he said, well, let's, let's look into that and let's see if we can find you a role. And he eventually did. So I moved into the PR role in 97 and did that for five years. And that was the late nineties were crazy times, right? And I mean, both good and bad. It was the, the labor issues were the, like really raging with uh, where we made our shoes overseas, but also we were doing some of the greatest advertising and marketing and, and new product launches like uh, free and shocks. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, presto, excuse me, all sorts of amazing Product was in the pipeline, and so there was it was a it was a whirlwind, right? I mean, and more Nike towns are opening, you know. So there's there's a lot going on, and it was fascinating. To your point earlier about never having the same day twice. I mean, there would be days I would literally come in to the, in the morning with a whole thing uh, uh, agenda of things to get done, and by three o'clock I'm on a plane to Chicago. <laughs> you know, I'm like <laughs> calling my wife, going, "Um, you're gonna have to pick up the kids at daycare because I'm going I'm going to Chicago." Oh wow! So I mean, that was good and bad. I mean, that was that was bad in terms of at least that was when you're really a young family that you you don't really want to have that level of uh, helter skelter. But that's the way it was in the '90s. Uh, and then I moved uh, in, in, in the 2002, they elevated uh, about three of us or four of us to create a global communications role because before that had just been by the different regions in the, in the world. And they wanted one smaller team to over orchestrate like the Olympics or the World Cup uh, communications that would be done on a macro level by us. And then we would then get handed out to the different uh, regions and they would make it local, make it more personal to, the, to their areas. So I did that for from 2002 to 2004 slash five. And the reason that was critical for the my role in the historian role was that part of that responsibility in this global position was to do the marketing communications for senior level executives. And I, I had Phil Knight and Mark Parker and a couple others and another two of my colleagues had the other some of the other direct uh, VPs and, and leaders. So I got to know and sit in and do a lot of uh, monitoring of interviews that they were doing with different news organizations and sales or to uh, shareholder meetings, things like that. And I just noticed that the stories shifted, drifted, 
Um, you mean like details were being forgot, things were yeah. changing? And then I paid Carolyn Davidson $35 for the swoosh. And like five minutes later, or five, or two days later, and then I paid Carolyn Davidson $75 for the swoosh, <laughs> you know? And just little, again, nothing, nothing like earth shattering, but it was just, just, I was like, we're a very much an oral storytelling company. You, you, you sit and listen to Nelson Ferris or Phil Knight or tell their stories and you're just absolutely enraptured. But there's nobody really writing them down. And even more importantly, cross-referencing them and, oh, I don't know, checking them for accuracy. So that was the the germ of the idea that I started to come to my head. And at the same time, I'd, I was friends with a, a man in, in a Nike design named Michael Shea. And he was telling me some similar challenges he was having with always looking to people for inspiration and new stories, but always being directed to like the same six to eight people. Hmm. And he's like, you know, we've had to, we've been around for years and years and years. It seems like there's gotta be more sources of inspiration, more people we could be talking to. And I, I knew from my own experience that he was, he was right. And so with this all started swirling together. And the next thing I know, um, we've got a presentation that we, when I came up with the acronym DNA department of Nike archives. And the, 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 the gist of it was that the current archive, which we had for since the late seventies, uh, needed an historian role, needed a story gathering and telling role. It was, um, it was more passive. It was more of a, a place where people went to put things and to retrieve things, but it wasn't a, a really a content generating opportunity. And that was the, that was the, the, the kernel of my presentation was that there would be an historian who would, who would not only capture and correct the information, but might also look for opportunities to tell the stories and when, where and how to, to tell these stories internally at that time. It's still mostly internal, but the, the idea was that we were not doing the company any service by not capturing these stories because Bill Barman, you know, passed away in 1999, Rob Strasser in 1993, you know, so some of the early pioneers were gone. And we couldn't do anything more than already existed. So I'm like, this is that we can't do this. We can't, we've got to talk to Phil Knight. We've got to talk to all the rest of the folks in the early generations. And there weren't any uh, tapes, uh, rec tape recordings of previous times, like in the seventies or eighties where people had sat down and told their side of the story. None of that really existed. Not that early. No, there was a group called film and video that came into being in the early eighties and they did, uh, they would do interviews. They would do um, usually for sales meetings, for presentations, so thankfully, yes, there were, there were some, I mean, it wasn't like Bill Byron passed and we had nothing on it, yeah. you know, but it wasn't, it was more piecemeal. It was more of a particular reason why we're talking to Bill as opposed to let's capture Bill's story. Let's capture his philosophies. Let's capture his thoughts on this, that, and the other thing. It was more of, we need him to talk about this. Okay. He did. Now we've got it. Yeah. So it was good, but it wasn't holistic and, and really thought out. And then again, it wasn't cross-referenced. So we might talk, there might've been one conversation or two conversations with a designer who worked on one shoe, but it was just his perspective. And it turns out there were like four people that worked on that shoe. Yeah. And so we needed to get their voices so that we have a choir instead of just one soloist. And we would end up getting better stories, especially if we could get them together in a room. Yeah, for and, sure. And the greatest example there I can give you is in um, 2010 or maybe early 11, we were getting close to the 40th anniversary of the swoosh, which came out in 71. And I knew that Jeff Johnson, who was the first full-time employee and the one, the man who came up with the name Nike, uh, he was going to be in town. He's retired and lives in, lives in New Hampshire. So he was going to be in town for an event. And Bob Waddell, employee number four was in, lives in Bend and he was going to be in town to see Jeff. Well, now I've got two of the four. Phil Knight was going to come to the same event. So now I got three of the four. And Carolyn Davidson, the designer of the swoosh, lives in Portland. And so I asked her to come out. So I got all four of these people together. Wow. In a sound studio on the Nike campus. I spent a butt ton of money, hired a bunch of photographers. So we had one camera on each of them. And then the fifth one capturing the room. And then we interviewed them for a good almost two hours. And before, before we started... You know, they're all mic'd up and we're, they're all laughing and getting happy to see each other. And I kind of, I gave them like a stern look and I said, okay, you people, just so you know, no one is leaving this room until we can all agree on where the name Nike came from and how much the switch, you know, where the switch, and they all laughed and they go, well, I can't promise that, you know, but the next almost two hours was magical because they were old friends, but they were all helping each other. You know, Jeff would say something and Phil goes, no, that can't be right because... 
So, and, and he would give, and Jeff goes, oh yeah, you're right, you're right. And then Bob would interject with, you know what actually happened was, and the next thing I know, they were actually percolating and getting the story clearer. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, when we were finished, I can't remember who told me. It might have been Carolyn, or maybe it was Phil. Anyway, they said, you know, this is the first time the four of us have been in the same room since the day that these guys picked the swoosh. Wow. So I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Because yeah. then I realized, well, Carolyn, was she was a, a, a consultant. She wasn't a, an employee of the company. So she probably wouldn't be around that much. And then, you know, Jeff retired in 1983. So, and, and I think Bob was in the late 80s. Uh, so it was not that many opportunities where they were all, and even if they did all get together, they shouldn't, certainly wouldn't all just sit around for two hours and talk about that, the 1971 period. So that, again, going back, that was like my, my day. That was like, okay, that was the day I, we really, we really kicked some ass today. Yeah, no, that's cool. Cause uh, that happens when I get together with my friends and we talk about stuff we did in high school and I'm like, I don't remember that. Yeah. You can just bounce little ideas off everybody and then you kind of start to get what you think is true. Yeah. Because, yeah, your memory is not as good as you want it to be. And you make yourself look cooler and somebody else wasn't quite as cool. I did the awesome thing. You know, like memory is crazy. And uh, I, this is just a theory. I don't know if it's true or not, but I would love if the whole thought that when you die, you can just basically watch your entire life on a DVD video, you know, with different <laughs> chapters and stuff. Yeah. That would be so cool. And you just go back and watch everything and be like, oh, that's what happened. Right. I don't remember going that way. Uh, well, that's really cool. So you you got all these guys together and then did did that ever get released in any way? Internally. Internally. They, they use it for some in, uh, on the internal DNA site and some other sales, I think a sales meme they used it at, yeah. And again, I, I would love, it would be amazing to get all this, not all, but a lot of this stuff external, but rights issues and, you know, there's all sorts of, not necessarily with these four necessarily, but uh, a lot of stuff that DNA does, it's with the understanding uh, from the inter- the person we interview that it will be used only for internal purposes or for educational purposes. So we would have to go back and ask person X or person Y, you know, we, we interviewed you on this topic and we'd like to put it on YouTube or whatever. And they'd have to approve it. And then if you start using names like FIFA and the you know, Olympics and IOC, I mean, then that, that becomes another layer and God forbid, if you use any music, you know, oh, and yeah. then, then they've got to get rights and permissions for that. So it becomes a increasingly more difficult process. So just being internal while it does limit the audience made our lives so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. I am always cautious of what I do or say or take pictures of when I'm on campus Mm -hmm. because Nike's very serious about secrecy on a number of things. And uh, you don't want to be in that position where where you get in trouble for some reason. No, no. And I I think of you uh, working with some top level individuals, that must have been fairly intimidating a lot of the time, making sure you didn't say the wrong thing. Well, yeah, I mean, in public relations, especially, you don't want to make a matter worse, you know, and you, and you have to be careful not to be flippant and make some comment that you, you think or you believe was uh, meant to be in humor. And then somebody either doesn't see the humor or it's <laughs> yeah. taken out of context. Next thing you know, you're walking into somebody's office explaining why you said yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, with the, with the historian role, it was really more a matter of helping people extricate and, and remember stories like I, there are many times when i had to literally tell somebody no oh, actually that didn't happen the way you remember it <laughs> and i had to be very sure of my facts right i'm not just gonna just say i don't think so i would i i mean jeff johnson's a great example he had forever said that he came up with the name nike in the fall of 1971 and nobody had ever questioned him. why would you i mean in, in some ways it doesn't was it really matter but as i was going through that seminal time period when the, the brand name comes up and the and the new swoosh comes along that's critical in the in the history of nike so i want to make sure i got it right and i kept finding references i, uh, I found a, a sales uh sheet basically had the prices of the shoes that we were selling at the time and also had the nike and it was dated june 1st 1971 and i thought that's weird i thought jeff said the king came up with the nike name in the fall and so a couple other things came up i found another another piece of evidence that, that pretty much put it at in june and the next thing, next time I saw Jeff when he came to town, I said, hey, I was just doing some more research and it looks like the swoosh and the name Nike came out in the spring of 71, not in the fall. He goes, no, no, it was the fall. <laughs> You're wrong. And, and I, I'm, but you know, he was actually, he pushed back. And so I, I actually had the documents, I had the, the copies of the, the things with me. And I said, well, here's this and here's that. And he goes, well, they probably just got those dates wrong. Like, so 
40 years ago, when it was happening right at that moment, they got the dates wrong. <laughs> but 40 years later, when you're trying to remember something, you're right. Yeah. You know? and, it was, and he's still, even to this day, when he talks about that, he'll say something like, well, I remember it as being the fall of 71, but I'm told it was earlier. You know, yeah. so he still won't, he won't give it to me. Yeah, there's something in there where he remembers it that way for some reason. Yeah. Huh. Uh, so you... At this point, had you they, they already had the facility with all the items in it. Yes. And you're accumulating all the stories and talking to everybody and trying to figure out the historical historical accuracy of everything. Yes. Uh I've heard that there's one of everything no. in this world. That that no. would be impossible, right? Yeah, we would have to have a gigantic warehouse. I mean, it's it's big enough as it is, but it would it would be crazy. And it's just there's again, it comes down to storytelling, right? I mean what story would you be able to tell and where where you had every Nike shoe ever made? You couldn't put it on in a, in a convention center. You couldn't put it on at, at an all-star game or something. It would just, there, you wouldn't, it'd be overwhelming. So you, we have to do some artwork, guesswork, um, you know, skill of, of determining what is a good, what you can tell a good story with. So you, do you want every LeBron? Yes. Do you want every, uh, when Tiger Woods is shoes? Yes. Michael's, of course. Um, do you need every shoe ever, every Pegasus? Yes, because Pegasus has been a long time brand. So people are interested in seeing the evolution of it, but some of the other, uh, names, some of the other shoes, maybe not, you don't need every one of them because they, it either, either there isn't enough of an iteration that's, that's interesting or a storytelling opportunity, or it's just one of those things like we just will never, we'll never tell the story of such and such. There's so many colorways. You, I mean, <laughs> yes. you go on the app now, there's 500 different options. Right. Oh, and, and stuff like Dunk and, and Air Force One. I mean, my God, if we had every one of the, I mean, those, that is one of those cases where we would try to keep as many different, because that's part of the story. Yeah. It, that there are so many variations of an Air Force One that that's, that is the story or part of it. So yes, but every Monarch we've ever done, you know, that's the dad shoe that we sell a lot of, <laughs> but do we need to have one of every one of them ever yeah. done? I, you know, we all, we erred on the side of no. So what do you think, I know you can't really quantify this, but what do you think would be the most valuable shoe? Probably like one of the early, one yeah. of the first ones? Well, I would say, well, and it's, I know it sounds like, like a cop out to say it's priceless, but I mean, the, the handmade shoes by Bill Barman, yeah. uh, I mean, again, those weren't technically Nike, but in terms of what we had in the archive, having a shoe that literally is one of a kind or one of a tiny, tiny number um, and can't be replaced. I would, I would say it's those. I mean, the shoes he made for Steve Prefontaine, then you've got, then you've got the, the Nexus, right? The Bill and Steve being involved. So those, those are the ones that I think we would consider to be the most um, valuable or invaluable. And are those just chilling at Phil's house or are they like in a <laughs> vault buried under the ocean? That I probably shouldn't get into, okay. but let's just say they're, they're, they're well care taken care of. Yeah. 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 It's, it's fascinating. It's just something you put on your feet and people have been doing it mm -hmm. forever. You've had to wear shoes. I mean, there's that cool line in air where he says, uh, people have been wearing shoes for thousands of years. And the only significant change that's happened was in the last 600 years when they differentiated between the left yeah. and the right. Mm -hmm. And it's true. They're just Items you put on your feet, like we were talking about earlier, your grandpa was selling basically the same thing to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you wore them no matter where you're going. Now you have, it's a status symbol. Uh, the company I work for, we did a, a private concert for Foreigner. And there were a bunch of Nike people there. I personally wasn't there, but I heard, and I've been to other events, people wear Jordans as dress shoes. Mm -hmm. You wear a three, four, five thousand dollar $5,000 suit with Jordans, like they are their next level. Yeah. It's so crazy. And that's just happened in the last 20 or 30 years. You can wear sneakers, brand new, you know, no, of course, no blemishes, no scuffs. Yeah. You can wear that to a high end luxury event where people are driving Maseratis. Yep. It's wild. I think there were some people not at the Oscars wearing, and there were, I know obviously SBs cause that's, that's more of a sport. But yeah, you, I, I didn't watch the Tonys last night, but probably wouldn't be surprised if there were some people wearing some Jordans or some uh, some uh, high-end shoe. Yeah, it became a different thing. Uh, and a lot of it is due to Michael Jordan mm -hmm. and all the stuff that happened. And uh, like I said, I read Shoe Dog. And okay, I got like 90 different directions I want to go. Um, <laughs> so you, 
you continued accumulating all these items and these stories and everything, and then you were asked to help Phil mm -hmm. write Shoe Doc, or, or at least give him... Right, I didn't, unless you've been talking to my mom, I didn't write the book. <laughs> <laughs> she was always telling people, and my son's writing a book for Phil, and I'm like, mom, please stop saying that. Uh, that's great. No. She's proud of you. Yes, yes, she is, which is fine, but, you know, again, stick to accuracy. Yeah. No, so Phil was looking, he came over to the archives in uh, 2012, and it was, that was not uncommon because he would come over a lot and what not, but it was uncommon that he would call and literally say, I'm on my way. So I remember hanging up the phone. I thought, well, that's interesting. What's going on? So he gets there and he sees, he says, where can we go to talk? And I'm like, again, not normal. So I was like, well, we can, and we found a conference room that we could go to. And that's when he said, you know, you've been bugging me for the last whatever number of years to write a book. And I said, yes. And he goes, I'm going to do it. I said, you're what? <laughs> you know, I was like, my, my, my head just was like, what? Uh, he said, do you, I need to your help though. I need to gather uh, old correspondence, uh, memos, anything that we have from especially the sixties. Do we have stuff like that? And I said, oh no, absolutely. We have a ton of that. In fact, I, I put together an entire binder. So I ran back to my desk and I have a three ring binder and they're all photographs. So, so I mean, all photocopies, so it's not the originals. And uh, it was like letters that he wrote to Jeff Johnson, Jeff Johnson letters to him. Uh, early flyers, things like that. And I said, he said, can I take this? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's your company. Go I just ahead. Said, no. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so, and I said, I also have a timeline that I've been put. I worked, I started from the first day I started an Ikea story and I, I started my own timeline because some of the ones that existed for years were wrong. And the more I got into it, the more I realized how wrong they were. And then they were just being repeated. So somebody would update the timeline and they would keep the wrong information from the previous timeline and then add more. So the, the DNA timeline that I created was to me as accurate as humanly possible. I mean, if they, there were only a handful of things on there that were just literally people's memories because we just didn't have another source. So, and I would even, t you know, put an asterisk saying like, you know, not corroborated. But I felt pretty comfortable that everything else I had in there was was accurate. And so I gave him that too. And he despaired. And he said, well, I'll be back in touch. And so, oh, but then, he, then on his way out, he said, please don't tell anybody about this. I said, anybody? He goes, anybody. <laughs> okay. So that went on for like the next two years. He would come over and I'd talk to him. And he would, I'd, he'd ask me to go to meet with this or meet with that or talk to somebody. And I and he said, I need this. Do we have any more of that? And I would find it for him and I'd just give it to him. And then about 2014 or so, either it came out or I, I, I think it came out. I think the word got out that he was working on his memoir. And my, I remember my wife said, oh, wow, that's amazing. Are you going to be working on that? I said, well, I've actually been working on it for two years. And she goes, you didn't tell me for two years? I said, no, I didn't tell my boss. I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. So yeah, so then from the from 2014 until it came out in 2016, uh, I was I was one of the editors to help them uh, just keep combing out a few little, little wrinkles, little like, well, that's still not right. Or this is actually what you're thinking of is this, but it was that. And that was pretty fun. It's a fantastic book. I had heard people talk about it because on campus, it's kind of like the Bible. Everybody has good things to say about it. And I'm like, whatever, you guys are just saying that because he's the CEO <laughs> and the founder. And then I got it and I read it. It is so easy to read. It's not, it's not over your head. It's not too eloquent and wordy. It's just, it's nuts and bolts, but poetically. Mm -hmm. Like it's just concise. And I love that it ends with the IPO. Like yes. he could have kept telling the story forever, but it's just like the early days and it's so exciting. Uh, it's a great book. It's a great book. And then they put the the movie out and I was really excited to, to watch the movie. I actually watched it again last night okay. just to like refresh. Cause I knew we were going to be talking about stuff. Um, but according to you, there are some things that are not quite factual. Unfortunately, yes. And this is where I have a hard time trying to encapsulate my feelings about the movie, right? Because it's entertaining for sure. Yeah. Um, a lot of what they put in there did happen. Some of it didn't. But even the stuff that did happen didn't happen the way they show it happening. So it, it's not one of those things where you can just say this, this, this and right, is right. It's like, this is right, but Rob Strasser did this, not Sonny Vaccaro. Mm. This isn't right. This never happened. And so, again, I'm I, going back to being Barry Buzzkill. I, I remember speaking to a group of Nike, current Nike employees, and after we'd screened the movie, 
And they're like, oh, that was amazing when X, this happened and that happened. And I just like, well, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't actually happen. Yeah. You know, and, and some people are like, well, what, what, what difference does it make? Right. I mean, it's just, it's just a movie. It's just, you know, it's, it's not a documentary. I heard that a million times. If I ever write my own book, it's going to be called, this is not a documentary. <laughs> but what, what happened, which is what I feared would happen is that people respond and quote and cite it now as if it were a documentary. Yeah. Like and, me just five minutes ago. <laughs> yes. And they'll say things like, oh my gosh, Dolores Jordan, what an amazing, I mean, to, to, to think that she was that tough of a negotiator to negotiate Michael's contract. I'm like, yeah, that was an amazing scene. Yeah. That didn't happen. Yeah. Michael had the, one of the greatest agents, David Falk, and, and his boss, whose name escapes me off the top of my head, and they negotiated the contract because that's what agents do. Yeah. And they had already been negotiating contracts with Rob Strasser for years. Not with Sonny Vaccaro. Sonny Vaccaro never negotiated contracts. Huh. I mean, he may have negotiated like the, the seed of it, but Rob was the closer. And I've heard every other sports marketing person from the from the that period uh, I still am in touch with has confirmed that that they would do the original conversations, and then Rob came in and closed. And That's closed Jason Bateman's character. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. So again, stuff was happening. It just wasn't happening by the person being shown in the movie. Or it would already, like we said, we already done contracts when, when they were making it out to be like this this deal breaker that well, Mrs. Jordan, we can't we can't do a, a royalty on shoes, so that's just not how it works. We've been doing that for like nine years. Like he'd already been doing that for nine years, with, and Rob Strasser had been doing that with NBA players since all the way back to 1975. That's a pretty big, glaring uh, omission or or dif differentiation from the fact because th they make that a huge point. Oh yeah, it's basically it's you're like oh shoot this isn't going to happen and like but I remember thinking what, what, what? <laughs> we've been doing that for a decade hmm. hmm yeah I mean that had the ability to be monstrous I mean I, they never say the percentage neither, that he got from neither, each and neither will I but it was uh, he's done well yeah I mean that yeah, that seems like the way you would want to do it if you were the athlete and you were putting your name on it but I also get it from Nike's perspective they're like. No, we're not going to do that. Like, huh? No, because again, they, what, a lot of that part about basketball struggling to get basketball off the ground was sort of true. I mean, we'd done the Supreme Court and the and the George Gervin and Iceman, and we, we'd had a number of NBA players. So it's, they're making it more dire uh, again, probably for cinematic. Uh, yeah, you know, but, well, I mean, that whole thing about the board of directors threatening to get rid of Nike basketball was complete fabrication, and mm -hmm. I, I got that from two people who were on the board in 1984. They both said that never happened. So I'm feeling pretty good about my sources. So Ben Affleck and Matt Damon and Hollywood were just hamming it up a little bit, just making it a little bit better story, I guess. Uh, sharpening things, making things more, give, you know, all it's all in, do or die. I mean, that, that's that's standard storytelling. It's just yeah. harder, in my opinion, when you're dealing with real characters, real people. It's one thing just to make up Raiders of the Lost Ark type of thing where you can go do um, literally to the point of like, oh my God, I mean, what an amazing thing. That if, if, that, if Indiana Jones actually, actually existed, you'd have to, I think, be a little more true to what he actually did versus the what's shown in the movie. So that was, and, and again, knowing people at Nike and knowing people that I've met through there, like I know Rob Strasser's daughter, mm -hmm. right? And so it had to have been difficult for her and her family to see a lot of stuff that their father, her father did assigned to Sonny Vaccaro. Mm -hmm. You know, so that bothered me, you know, hmm. but it's, again, I still tell people to see the movie and to enjoy it, but just don't quote it and, and take it as gospel. Yeah. Well, what about the scenes with, uh, I forget his last name, but Pete designing the, the Jordan one? Uh, Peter is, is actually was Peter. He never went by Pete. So okay. that was another one of those head scratchers like Pete. Let's be like, you know, calling him Mike Jordan, right? It's just, he just went by Michael. Peter, so Peter Moore, yes. Peter Moore was the creative director for the entire company. And he did work on the Jordan, the first Jordan. Did he do it in one weekend? No, no, that just isn't done. Uh, in fact, the shoe that Jordan first wore when he came into the NBA in the, in the, in the preseason was not even the Jordan. It was actually the airship. Okay. Because you, you, it takes a good... At that, especially back then, it takes a good 16 to 18 months to take a shoe from original concept to actual on your foot. Yeah. Uh, so that was boiled down dramatically in the movie. And again, that's fine. You don't want to, I mean, how boring would it be to see 17 different meetings where they're talking about moving a, <laughs> this or that? I mean, so yeah. so I, I get that, but but yeah, yeah that, that whole thing. And, and Peter and, and, and Sonny basically talking about it being the greatest shoe ever made. And it's like, it's not really. I mean, it's, 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 it's iconic. 
but it was more just a, a variations of previous shoes that already existed because that there wasn't time to do a new shoe from scratch. It's got a little bit of this and a little bit of that from other shoes that were already in, in Nike's line. Mm-hmm. Uh, the colorway, yeah, the the black and the red, that was that was amazing and 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 controversial. But there was no pre. It wasn't like they, that whole thing about getting paid, you know, or getting fined five thousand dollars. We know we're going to get fined up front. That didn't exist either. That the again, this is where there was truth. There was a fine. It was levied. Uh, without their expectation, as levied at a thousand dollars by the the NBA, and then that's when Rob Strasser in real life said, "Well, shoot, I'll write a check for eighty thousand dollars right now." Yeah, and pay, and that's when the, the commissioner raised the ante and said, "Now the second time will be five thousand, and the third time he'll be suspended." Oh, like, oh, checkmate! You know? Yeah, so that's when Nike then created a, a shoe that followed along with the the color guidelines for. Uh. Or the NBA. See, that part's cool because you're you're looking at it and you're like, yeah, of course you're going to pay the fine. That's awesome. You're like, we're going to design whatever shoe we want. We'll pay the money. Who cares? Yeah. Well, and I was, again, sticking it to the, the, I mean, what difference does it make if a shoe is 40% or 50% yeah. white? You know, it's like one of those arbitrary, why do you even have this rule rules? Yeah. And, and Nike hates those type of things. Yeah. It's like, you just have a rule to have a rule. Yeah. Rules are for breaking. Uh yeah, that that part was pretty cool. Um, so again, it's there's truth adjacent, right? It's it's it was sort of true, mm-hmm. and that's that's where I scratch my head sometimes. Like you mm-hmm. could have actually told the actual story, and it's just as good. Yeah. So the culture in Nike at that time—that's the other cool part that I really enjoyed about Shoe Dog is you get this sense that it's like a scrappy underdog that mm-hmm. is going to fail at any moment. I mean, he's talking yes. about like he couldn't make payroll. Mm-hmm. And like the company's about to go under because they owe the bank $10 million or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. That stuff is insane. And he he's just struggling all the time. And then they finally make it to the IPO. And now he's got $180 million, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So that was in 81? December of 80. December of 80. And then they signed Jordan in August of 84? That's right. So four yeah. years go by. They're a public company. They're mm-hmm. making money. They're mm-hmm. doing good. But they still weren't Nike. It's when they signed Jordan and when all that stuff happened, that's when sneaker culture kind of started to become a thing. I remember when I was a kid in 1993, and I I vividly remember going to, it was called Le Breton's. It's a, just a family-run shoe store in the Dallas. We went to Le Breton's Shoes to get school shoes. And I got, I think they're Jordan 6s. And my dad spent... $110 on sneakers in 1993 yeah. for a nine-year-old. Like I even understood like, whoa, dude, that's crazy. That was 93. I was just a kid, Michael Jordan. Like it has just intensified mm-hmm. since then. Mm-hmm. It just became this thing. And I think that's why the movie's so cool, even though it's not completely factual. Like it sets the the tone that Nike was a company making money, but it didn't become the thing until this event it was definitely the catalyst right yeah. so so we had we had badly mis uh mis bet or whatever the term we, we you know we, we didn't think aerobics was going to go anywhere near where it became right so reebok basically just said okay thank you we'll take this business and went gangbusters so we then found ourselves in second place which you know we'd taken forever to, to get past adidas in the first and then we got bumped back into second and we were in a quandary, right? It's like, well, what do we, we tried to do some aerobic shoes. They were sort of me too. They weren't really that great. Uh, and, that's, and even some of the designers who did the shoes will admit that they were, they were just more of a hurry up. And so the Jordan brand, the Jordan, well, the Jordan line, the Jordan first Jordan was a godsend, right? I mean, they originally, they thought it would make a few million and it ended up making over a hundred and some odd million dollars. Hmm. Um, the downside of that though, is we saturated the market. We made way more shoes than, I mean, we had the we had the desire for them, but then the Jordan Two came out, and people are like, "Yeah, I've already spent a lot of money on the Jordan, and Michael gets hurt. Um, the Jordan Two wasn't really that remarkable, so you know, then it starts to to fade. So that was when uh, that's when we had another inflection point. So then the Jordan Three, the challenge there was that was when Peter Moore and Rob Strasser were exiting the company, and Peter was working on the shoe. So then Tink, uh, Tinker Hatfield was asked to come in and to uh, to pick up where where Peter had left off, and so that was one of those do or die. So the three, the, in my mind, in some ways, the Jordan three was almost even more important than. I mean, the one is obviously critical, but I mean, if three weren't successful, 
the franchise might have just hobbled off and, and disappeared. But three came, it brought it back. And so now you're in 86, 87. Uh, 87, we have the air uh, revolution campaign or the visible air. Mm -hmm. The air trainer comes out, Bo Jackson's shoe, which leads to Bo Nose and cross training. 88, we have Just Do It. And that whole campaign brings some more life. So by 88, 87, 88, 89, you've got Revolution, Bo Knows, Just Do It. And by 90, we had caught, or 90 or 91, we had caught up with Reebok again. And then in the, in the rest of the 90s, we tripled from 3 billion to 9 billion. And I think Reebok went from like 3 billion to 3.2 billion or something. Mm -hmm. you know. And it was never, this, no one's ever gotten close since. No. So that was... The late 90s, or pardon me, late 80s and into the 90s were just absolutely critical. And the 90s itself was just nuts. I mean, growth like you can't believe. Well, and that's when you started. 92. Yeah. yeah. So you're welcome, Nike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have managed to sell cool. It is synonymous with cool. And they're, I mean, they, they get rappers to wear the swoosh. They get sports people. Um it's one of the most unique brands that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. And I love how simple it is. It's so, that's what's so cool. I, I'm way into branding and marketing and I love logo critique and figuring out why a color will do something emotionally to you and why a shape will. And the swoosh is one of the most incredible things ever created. It's so distinctive and you don't even know what it is. Right. I mean, I think he says in the book, like they didn't know what it was. Well, there's uh, swoosh has a weird start. Right? I mean, th the first time it's actually used is in 1969 in a print ad, and it was ref they basically it was either Phil or Jeff Johnson. They both nobody seems to agree with who it was. Um, wrote that the nylon upper was was swoosh fiber. That's the first time we've ever seen it in print. Um, and then in 1971, when they were coming up with the, the brand, when Carolyn came up with the, well, not the brand but the, just the logo, uh, it was just called the stripe. Nobody had names. I mean, Adidas had three stripes, you know, Tiger had two stripes or whatever. And, little, and, and this was just a stripe. And somehow, and I've never found that smoking gun or that memo or that that moment. Over time, the the, brand, the logo became known as the swoosh. And, there's, and now there's been sort of retro explanation. Like some people say, it's the sound of a runner passing by you. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of that has just been manufactured or, or has been assumed. Like there, a lot of people think that the swoosh is uh, representative or, or, or looks like the wing and the goddess of Nike, mm -hmm. which would be a fabulous story if it were true, <laughs> except the swoosh came first mm -hmm. and then the name Nike. And I, I think Jeff Johnson probably is the one that created the, the confusion years later by saying, well, and it didn't hurt when he was coming up with the name Nike. It didn't hurt that the Nike swoosh or the swoosh had a wing-like look to it. So people have reverse engineered that to say that, that's what what inspired it. It's like, mm -hmm. no, it's just one of those happy coincidences. But those are the things I dealt with all the time. Yeah. But yeah, the swoosh itself, uh, Carolyn has told me that she was told to create something that connoted motion, you know, so that little, it starts fat and it kind of gets thin as, so it looks like it's it's moving. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some level of, can you make it? So it's, uh, it's, it's actually uh, helpful to the, the, the structure of the shoe. Uh, that the early swooshes are hilarious when you put when you put a bunch of Nike shoes from them from seventy two to about seventy five together. There's fat swooshes, skinny swooshes, really long ones, really short ones because it was just whatever the designer could do to fit it on the shoe or whatever need there was. And at some point, the so called swoosh police came in and said, "No, no, 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 you, you, you can't, you can't keep messing with the logo. I mean, there's certain trademark issues that you have to be careful of, or you can lose your trademark." Yeah. When she came in, did she have multiples or was it just, this is it? She had multiples. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, she didn't save them or she did. We we have a couple of drawings from an early newsletter where they showed one. One was just a, a circle, a, just, a, just a dot or a circle, big, I don't even know what, I mean, to me, I would look at that and like, huh. But she, according to her recollection, she presented, uh, I think she said a half a dozen and none of them not really liked any of them. So she came back a couple of weeks later and had more. And in those was the swoosh. Huh. And why did they choose her? She was, she was just a college kid, wasn't she? she so Phil in 1969, Phil was a, uh, was not working yet full time for Blue Ribbon Sports. He was working for uh, uh, Portland State University as an accounting teacher. I don't think he was a professor, but an accounting teacher. 
And he was walking through the halls at PSU and Carolyn was with a girlfriend just leaning against a wall in the hallway, not in accounting, just they were just in the hallway and he walked by just as she was saying something along the lines of she needed to make some side money for, and this is where they, their memories disagree. Phil says that she said she was making money, need to make money for the prom and Carolyn looked at him and she goes, I was in college. I didn't go to a prom. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, for whatever reason, she made a comment just as Phil walked by that she could look, she was, could use a little extra side money. And Phil walked away and then came back and said, "You know, we I have a small company, and I need somebody who can do uh, graphic work and and maybe make a, a, a an ad or some charts, things like that for presentations. And would you be interested?" And she said, "Yes." And so she charged him two dollars an hour for the work that she did. And this is in '69, so people mix get that messed up a lot too. It wasn't until '71 that he was looking for a mark that he went to the person who'd been doing the, the uh, graphic work for him and asked her if she could try putting her hand to making up some designs for, for the side of, for the shoe. And like, this is another common myth at Nike. So she charged $35. So people immediately assume that she works 17 and a half hours because two times 17.5 is 35. And Carolyn has said in no uncertain terms that that's absolutely not true. She goes, I worked way more hours on it than that. She goes, I just was brand, I was brand new. And so they said, send me a bill. And I said, well, $35 seems fair. <laughs> and, so, and of course, people have been getting Phil shit for years, yeah. right? You, you paid her $35? Yeah. You know? And But Carolyn even laughed. She said, I don't, I said, do you have the invoice? And she said, I don't even know if I did an invoice. I, it was just, it was just another thing. Yeah. Right. If she goes, if I had known what it would have turned into, then absolutely we would have acted differently. But they just asked me to do this design that day. And I did. And so I charged them $35. Mm -hmm. And so, Again, just so I can get Phil off the hook. So in 1983, uh, Carolyn was invited out to the Nike uh, headquarters. This is not the one where it is now, but uh, further down Murray. And there was a surprise luncheon for her. And they had a ring made, a, a gold ring with diamond uh, swoosh on it. And then a, a little packet full of Nike stock that uh, she never divulged what was in there. Phil in his book he said how many shares it was. And she was kind of like, I never told people that. So, <laughs> but it was, it was, it was more money than $35. Yeah. So, and she's always been very, very uh, happy and, and pleased that that was done because they didn't have to. Well, yeah. And that's so cool anyway. She, she gets to tell that story and she gets to see her work. Every time she sees a Nike, she's like, I did that. I asked her that one time. I said, do you still get a thrill or is it, or is it just not washed over you because the swoosh is so ubiquitous? And she goes, no, every once in a while, if I'm watching a sports game and I see a swoosh on a, a jersey or if I'm on the bus and I see somebody wearing, I do pause for a second. And what's the coolest thing ever is she's just a lovely person, but she's like, well, she's now and she's in her 80s. I think mean, she's like your grandma, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you saw her on the bus, you wouldn't say, it looks like Carolyn Davidson, the designer of the swoosh. And she's so anonymous that yeah. way. And yet what she did was so impactful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, okay, well, we're, we're getting close, but I also want to talk about um, Back to the Future. And I don't even know what it's called. What, what is the shoe from Back to the Future Oh, the, Air, the Mag, Air Mag. It's, Air it's Mag. sort of been yeah, retro named, yeah. What was the significance of that situation? What's the story behind that? Well, so if I'm hopefully it's not a spoiler alert after all these years that Marty McFly goes forward into the future <laughs> uh, in the second movie, and you can't wear today's sneakers in 2015 or whatever. I think it was that was when it was set, and so they were approached. Nike was approached, and Tinker Hatfield worked on. Was it Tinker? Wait, gosh, I'm going to make sure I have the story right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it was Tinker. I don't. Remember. I don't know. Now I think about it, but so the Nike design was asked to work on the shoe. And so they came up with like, well, what would a shoe 30 years from now have? And, and it's a self-lacing. And you know, so they, they had some fun playing with that. And the shoe was so incredibly popular that we, when, when the actual 2015 started to come around, there was this groundswell of people saying we should create that shoe. We should create a shoe that was, you know, now as close to it as, and we still can't do, still don't have hover, hoverboards and things like that, that we thought we would have. Someday. Someday. But, uh. So yeah, so that shoe was created uh, and sold at retail, or sold, I think, at auction. There was they created a limited number that they sold and they raised money for Michael uh, J. Fox's one of his charities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that would have been in. I mean, if I think the first one came out in '85, so that was right around the time with the Jordan One and everything. So that was mm -hmm. that was like a pretty pivotal uh, couple years at mm -hmm. Nike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they put that shoe out, 
And then, like you said, they put out the reissue in 2015, but they only made 500 pairs? I think so. And I think they were, like I said, they were auctioned to raise money for um, for at least one, maybe just one charity, but that was done. And I think it was actually before 2015 because there was a lot of, um, boy, I, I should have boned up on this because I don't remember. Because there, there was some some uh, urgency to us. People wanted to do it sooner rather than later. So I don't know. I think it might have even come out in 14 or 15, before okay. 15. But anyway. Oh. Why, why didn't they mass produce them? Are they too difficult to make? I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. That's, and, and um, you know, I wasn't involved in that particular, I haven't researched that, but one of my staff actually did. So I don't have, unfortunately, right at my brain's fingertips. Yeah. You can't know everything, Scott. I, uh, I would tell people <laughs> that too sometimes. I'm like, you have any idea how hard it'd be to know everything Nike yeah. ever did? Yeah. So I have, I had my staff of, I have seven or had seven people on the staff. And so we would, we would essentially farm out you know so i have one person who's like a total basketball a guy who knows everything about basketball and soccer and there's another one a person who knows everything about women's branding and running you know so so sometimes when i have that luxury when i'm not being asked to do like a general presentation i can say you know you really should talk to you. let's bring in you know and then that mm -hmm. person can go on forever about uh, different things but yeah i'm more i'm more of the generalist about like the blue ribbon sports the 20th century that was really more of where i had my uh spent a lot of my expertise and time because i I would interview more of those people and then that would build, right? So if I would talk to Tom Carmody, who was an early marketing guy, he was the one that decided that Nike would go with Dan Wyden and Dave Kennedy to start their new agency. So I would talk to him and then he'd say, oh, if you're talking to me, you should talk to Jim Gorman, you know? And so those, those would be all like early, early Nike people from the 60s and, and the early 70s. And so then once I talked to Jim Gorman and Tom Carmody, then I was like well more um, loaded for bear for, to be able to talk to, to do more interviews in that same group. Cause I had that information at, at hand and I could do a better interview. Cause I could say, well, Jim Gorman told me da 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 da, And then I would get a better interview with the next person. So yeah. that's why I decided I'm going to, I'm going to be like the, the guy from like 1970 or the sixties to 20th, the end of the 20th century. And then I'll let my staff, <laughs> they can take it from there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many stories and so many facts to, to maintain in your brain. So I get it. Uh, what number were you? What employee number? 17955. Five. 17955. Five. And that was in 92. Mm -hmm. So now they've got to be over 100,000. Oh, it's a six digit number now. It's, uh, I think, even up in six or starts with six or seven. I mean, it's like, wow. it's way, maybe not that high, but yeah, that's, there's a lot of people that's worked, that yeah. worked at Nike over there. Yeah. So at DNA, uh, before you retired, you're, you're, you're helping uh, Phil get all the stuff ready for Shoe Dog. And we, I mean, so would you go to the DNA building every day? Was I, that your home I, base? Originally, no. We were in another building. Uh, the warehouse staff that just managed the the, the uh, uh, archives was in that building. We the the communications folks, the writers, we were in a different building, and we thought that was silly, right? It was like so inconvenient to go back and forth all the time. So we were moved into there. I don't remember exactly what year, but quite a number of years ago. So we were, yeah, we were one of, uh, there was only like 25 people in the entire building. So mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was a big cavernous building, which I will not locate uh, for you or tell you where it, buddy. Um, but it was fun. It was like literally coming in every day and just walking past Nike history everywhere. Yeah. I feel like if that were my position, I would just get lost looking at stuff for hours a day. I mean, you just go out and walk around and find things. Uh, yes and no. I mean, like anything after a while you do just become, I don't want to say inured to it, but you, you just don't stop. And like we have a little, we have little penny, one of the little penny puppets that was in the original campaign, a little ad campaign. We have it on a display case in, in one part of the building. And for a while I would always stop by and look at it. And after a while I was like, Hey little, you know, you just kind of walk right past <laughs> it because you, you got somewhere else to be. Um, but it was always fun to bring people in. Uh, and then they would see little penny and they like, Oh my God, is that one of the originals? You know? And, and then you'd see like Bo, Bo Jackson surfboard up on a, you know, from the Bo Don't Surf campaign that we did with Bo Nose, and there's the surfboard, you know, so there were, people would have that instant reaction, especially the real sneakerheads, and that was fun to kind of see it through their eyes again. It's essentially a Nike museum. A lot of that stuff could end yeah. up in a museum. It could, and we would love, I would have loved to have had a museum experience if we could have, but that again becomes all sorts of nightmares of, of approvals and rights and permissions and fees and, or not fees, but, uh, you know, royalties, you know, you can't, I mean, the Revolution ad was one of the most iconic ones we ever did. Um, but to to get permission from the Beatles or whoever owns their their sound or their music library now, it would be astronomically expensive. But yeah. you can't really tell the story of Nike marketing or Nike advertising without that particular ad. So that was that was always a real 
unfortunate uh, thing where life and, and the realities of legal issues and rights issues was like, this, this can't, this isn't going to work. At least we couldn't have come up with a way. Hopefully maybe somebody else does or uh-huh. they can come up with a, a, a museum of some kind. Yeah. Cause I mean, you don't have to say if you know anything or not, but it seems like that's kind of like the next step. It seems like that's something that somebody could put together. I mean, almost on par with like a Disney world or, you know, just like some experience. To, I mean, the people at Nike would kill that if they were allowed a space. Cause I mean, I, I've seen the different concepts uh, for storefronts, things mm-hmm. like that. If mm-hmm. you could have an entire space to tell the history of the, like that would be insane. It would be amazing. Yeah. And we, I mean, even at Nike, the the employees at the company can't get into the the, the archive building uh, with just their badge. They have to have a higher level badge access. And that's unfortunate because it would be nice to have employees come over anytime. Mm-hmm. Um, you think they're worried about things walking away? Uh, it's a little bit that it's also the the building that it's in is not really situated such a way that you could do front of the house, back of the house pretty easily. It's yeah. it's all too entwined. So you'd have to redo the entire layout of the building. And I, I don't know. I mean, again, I've been away now for over almost a year and a half. So I don't know where, um, where they're heading or what their, their plan is. But mm-hmm. I, I know that we'd always wished we could have been more public facing and mm-hmm. whether that was a YouTube channel or uh, even a Twitter or maybe TikTok now, um, you know, so we could actually do our own content directly. Yeah, um, It's always filtered now through uh, the communications department or through different groups. And again, that's their profession. They, they know how to communicate to the, co- the core consumers. So that's smart, but it's also, I, I just feel like there's, it could be more genuine if it came directly from DNA, but yeah. that's not my call anymore. Well, you did a fantastic job with everything there and Thank all that you. you've accomplished. And um... it's very gratifying. The whole 50th anniversary last year when they were celebrating, I had retired by then, but to see a lot of our work, being used in different ways was like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's why we did it. That's very cool. It, it goes back to everything I've done, everything that you've done. I mean, you're, you, you aren't, uh, dealing with race cars anymore. You're, you're, no. you accumulated all this data. You told a story of one of the most important companies that ever existed and you get to experience it and be rewarded with your work. It's really cool. Yep. It's really cool. I appreciate you coming and talk to me. That was my pleasure. Awesome.